Today, as part of our Healthy Ireland at Your Library series, we're talking to Patter Maxwell, a senior psychologist with the HSC, giving advice to parents of young children. So, Patty, you're very welcome to our discussion today on parenting as part of Healthy Ireland at Your Library series. It's a very different way that we parent today in this generation to how perhaps we were raised. Yeah, yeah. So parenting has, has taken a real leap forward and uh, we describe it as positive parenting, which is an umbrella term that kind of describes a different approach to, to parenting. So it's, it's less based, let's say, on consequence and punishment and more based on the relationship between you and your child and the whole idea of discipline, having positive discipline in your home. So, so that discipline transfers into school, into the community, into your child's friendships and relationships. It's a really different way to think about parenting. Because originally we would have had like a hierarchy that you must respect your elders and that's yeah. not to say that's been done away with and I think we also as parents worry about being their friends yeah. instead of their parents. So yeah. where's the, the line between that? Yeah. Well, I, I would think that the hierarchy is still there. So the, the idea that your parent is in charge would be a really key part of positive parenting. We haven't thrown that out. Um, I suppose one of the differences would be, would be in the relationship. So maybe traditionally we would have expected parents to watch out to see if their kids have done wrong um, and then to co consequent that behavior. So that might be a punishment. Um, the difference would be looking at discipline. So discipline is different. Discipline comes from the word to teach. And if you think about that, we are our children's mentor. And we have that role as a parent to kind of go back and remember our hopes and dreams. So if you think about whether you're talking about your five-year-old heading off to primary school or your 13-year-old going off to first year, um, to think about the skills that they need and your role as a parent in passing on those skills. So those skills include respect, um, being able to express their emotions, being independent, um, being part of the family, minding themselves in public, all of those kinds of things. So in many ways, it's not that different because respect and, and honoring your parent is, is a key part of positive parenting. The difference is how we respond, I suppose, to our children. We're looking more at um, things from their perspective. So we're inviting parents to remember their first day of school. We're inviting parents to remember a little rebellion that they had. What were they feeling? What were they trying to achieve? Um, did it help how other people reacted or did it make it worse? So instead of focusing on the negative and punishing that, we are looking at all of these situations as a learning opportunity and being a bit more positive in our reaction? Absolutely. We're looking at parenting as a learning opportunity. And so most good parenting, if you like, happens when there's nothing going wrong. That's when the best parenting happens. We discipline our ch child really well when things are going well. So if I've um, taken the time to take my ch children for a walk in the park or to the beach and we're talking about nature and we're speaking in a respectful tone and we're minding the environment, I'm passing on so much information. I care about the environment. I, I want to spend time with you. I'm curious about the environment. So we're passing on so much. If uh, we're visiting grandparents and uh, everything is going really well and we're speaking to one another in a, in, in a nice tone, if my child has helped their grandparent or their sibling with something, these are wonderful times to, to discipline our child, to teach our child, in other words, teach them how to interact socially, teach them how to show empathy and care to others. Is there a feeling that if we don't shout, if we don't punish, that our kids will run riot and, and be wild, that we're mollycoddling our kids too much today? Yeah. And that, that is absolutely a fear. And it's a well-founded fear because if parents parent in a kind of a passive way, let them run free, let them express all of their thoughts, then they could run the risk of their children kind of going out there socially and not knowing how to mind themselves in the environment. I mean, if we think that, for example, bad language is okay at home, they might think that that's okay in their friend's house, in school, out and about. So, so that wouldn't be good parenting. So it's assertive parenting. It's parenting reminding yourself that I'm the adult, I'm in charge, but I also have this responsibility to pass on 
the knowledge that I have to, to enhance their skills, to, to look for gaps in their skills and to teach them the skill. Rather than saying, for example, we could say, she's never going to learn manners. You might say, she's more energetic than her brother. Um, she maybe needs a bit more time to incorporate this skill. So we might say, with this particular child, I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna talk about the importance of maybe our indoor voice, or maybe saying please and thank you, or maybe using people's names uh, when I'm speaking to them. So how to ask for things. So it could be something as simple as that, but it doesn't exclude consequences. And that's sometimes a fear for parents. So if your child perhaps has um, done something that, that you feel is unacceptable, they've been aggressive, they've hurt their sibling, they've done something that, that really isn't the right thing, we do consequent our children. And it is really important to do that. But consequences should be fair and they should make sense to the child. So I would be saying to parents, don't ground your child for three or four days because they've used a bad word or they haven't said please or thank you. You know, day three into that, you'll wonder who you're punishing. It's about kind of giving your child a consequence that helps them to reflect maybe on the bad behavior, but then also talking to them about how they could handle it the next time, whether that's a tantrum at a supermarket or maybe disrespect, uh, uh, you know, when you're visiting friends or family. And what are some of the traps then the parents can fall into? Okay, so there's many traps. Um, so one trap could be focusing too much on when something's gone wrong. So really dwelling on when something has gone wrong and, uh, and talking about it too long. Keep your conversations brief. Children's brains are not quite ready for big, long intellectual explanations of things. They kind of switch off quite quickly. So, so that's one thing. The other thing, which is probably the biggest trap that we can fall into, is not catching them being good, not noticing the good behavior. So if parents kind of noticed maybe when our child cooperates or when our child does something that we really admire, talk about that, to praise them. Don't be afraid of praise and to actually praise them. And what would I, would, I would say is, I would say descriptively praise your child. So um, when you're trying to catch them being good, you might be, I don't know, working in the kitchen, looking out the window, and your older sibling who doesn't show a lot of interest in their younger sibling, maybe the younger sibling has fallen and they've helped them up. And you didn't think they would do that. Later on, in a not very dramatic way, just say, Sean, I saw you help Emily up. That's a great big brother thing to do. And so you're reinforcing for Sean what you see as big brother behavior. Because you forget, don't you? That's sort of the accepted level of behavior that yeah. you're looking for. So you forget to point it out. Whereas it is. they're learning yeah. good and bad behavior. So they need that praise. Yeah. And, and some, of, some of our children get into trouble a lot. Some have developmental differences that might maybe cause them to get into trouble more. They might have an attention difficulty. They might be more impulsive than another child. So they find that they're being given out to a lot in school, given out to at home, maybe not invited so much. So if your child is in that situation and you find that people are calling out her name a lot, that they're, they're drawing attention to her behavior, um, that's the child you really have to focus on catching her being good. The little things that she does that shows cooperation, that shows kindness, they're there, they happen. We just miss them. And describing them, using her name, describing the behavior, and then moving on from the scenario. So you don't make too big of a deal of it. Yeah, because you don't want to say you're always doing this and no. you're always, and last Tuesday you did this as well. You don't want to blow things out of all proportion. Just yeah. deal with it and then move on. And also you suggest the parents don't focus too much on talking about their own feelings. Yeah. So just being careful of that. I mean, obviously, we would be advising parents to not um, dwell too much on upsets. So if a child has an upset, address the upset. They've had a little fall. They've got a boo-boo. Yeah, do the things you would do and move on from that. So it's almost like you're teaching them to get back up on their horse. If there's been an upset in school, use problem solving as a way to get over that. And we can talk about that. Um, but if it's our own upsets, if we're upset about things, just to be mindful that um, it is okay to share your feelings. If you're sad, if you're upset, if you're tired, if you're bored, it's okay to share those feelings and say, I really miss granddad, you know, and I'm sad about that. Or you might say, I really don't like um, working from home sometimes. I miss my colleagues. Um, so you can share those kinds of things. But of course, if they're financial, if they're couple, um, if they're adult oriented themes, it's best to solve those problems. Maybe with a trusted friend, an adult sibling, or maybe step outside of our family and speak to somebody professionally. 
Okay, and you've devised eight things that you think kids today wish their parents knew. And it's not in a judgment way, it's just a no. nice way of us to discuss yeah. how to integrate positive parenting into your home. Yeah. So we would often be talking to parents about maybe my child is starting a new phase in their life. They're finishing up preschool, they're, they're maybe starting big school, or they've been there for a while and they're struggling a little bit with the, the, the new demands. There's lots of new demands. So one of the first things we would say is to encourage me to be comfortable expressing my feelings. Um, allow me to express my feelings, whether they're positive feelings or negative feelings. Allow me to be comfortable with those and encourage me to express them. What about those emotions then that you mentioned? So if you've got a kid that shouts a lot in <clears> anger, <throat> if they cry a lot, you mm. want them to be able to feel those feelings, but Absolutely. quite often we say, stop crying, stop shouting. Yeah. What, what's the, the yeah. right way? Yeah, so I, I would ask a parent to imagine a time that they've been sad and that they felt tearful. And somebody has said to them, could you please stop crying? No crying at this funeral, you know. Uh, could you please stop looking so upset? It's just going to make us feel mm. horrible about expressing our feelings. Now, what they're going through might be something that's quite trivial in our adult world and something that we've kind of forgotten that's really important to them. So take a step back and say, what's going on for you? What was happening before? Generally speaking, when our children cry a lot, there's generally a theme around what has been going on. And, and sometimes it's not so obvious, uh, crying before soccer, crying after soccer, crying just before school. And sometimes the theme there is, I feel different, I feel excluded, I don't know who to talk to, I'm shy, and the others are all full of energy and they're really out there. So, so ask your child what's going on for them. And is there anything that they think could make it better for them. So it's how this expressing your feelings and being a problem solver can really come together. And what we're doing is we're teaching our child to integrate that emotional side of their brain and the thinking side of the brain that's not quite integrated until well into adolescence. But we're, we're beginning that skill of putting those two parts together and saying, okay, you can have your feelings, um, but there might be something we can do about it. It's really hard for us to give our kids independence, to yeah. let them go and protect them at the same time. Sometimes yeah. I think the Madeleine McCann story changed everything because the worst case scenario yeah, can happen or did happen. Yeah. And even though that statistic is still quite low, mm. how do we teach our kids mm. independence mm. And, and keep our own sense of peace? Well, I suppose um, child development is sequential and it's really important to remember that. We build on one skill at a time and, and subparts of a skin. So just as we kind of all learned maybe to go out there and talk to others and then we learned how to flirt and then we learned how to approach somebody and then eventually we had our first relationships that we built on all of those kinds of skills. And kids generations before were let out the back door and called back for tea time. Now we're on top of them Absolutely, night and day. yeah. They were learning how to play with people of different ages, uh, uh, mixed genders and, uh, and to get physically active. We, we do live in a changed world and, um, and I suppose we need to remember that. So remembering that our child is learning their skills bit by bit, that's, that's really, really important. But also keeping in mind that independence is key too. So we can't allow fear to stop us from giving them independence. They're going to need independence. If we don't give our children some independence when they're little, it's going to come back and bite us when they're older. We're going to be irritated. We're going to feel like they're dragging on us. We're going to wonder why they can't do things. You know, why, you, why can't you go and ring this company and figure out your phone credit? I can't, I don't have the time to do that. Yeah, so, so we want to start that early. So start that, that early. Giving them jobs around the house, yeah. teaching them their own self-care from an absolutely. early age. Yeah, absolutely. So it's giving them jobs around the house and really importantly, self-care, teaching them self-care. Because if children don't have good self-care, that isn't just about independence. That's, that's a social skill that is so incredibly important for childhood and adolescence. Um, if we don't have good self-care, we can become the butt of jokes. We can be picked on and we can be excluded. Um, so whether it's the little ones calling the guy with the messy yogurt all the way down his uniform a baby or, or later on it's other things, it's really, really key. So it's very easy to go oh God, I'm in such a hurry, I want to get to work, we have to get places, sit on the stairs and I'll tie your shoelaces um, or do all these things for you. 
But if we actually stop and invest the time, our child will learn how to do these things. Now, I'm not suggesting that we do it on Tuesday morning when we have to be 30 minutes away in 15 minutes. Yeah. I'm not suggesting that. Or we leave them in the house alone and expect to come home no, to dinner, absolutely mate. absolutely not. But we do these things in little steps. We pick moments. As I said before, the best time to discipline or to teach is when nothing is going wrong. So I would probably do the shoelaces for him and send him out to school so I get to work on time. And then maybe later on, I would sit down and say, there's something that we've got to figure out. Nice, calm time, take out the shoes, let him figure out how to put on the shoes and then go through it. And we might have to repeat it again and again for one child and maybe it's twice for another child. Our children are all unique. But, but helping them with those independent skills, it's a real gift to them because it's teaching them competence. Competence is this sense of, I know how to do things. So maybe as an adult, you remember when you got your driving license, or maybe when you figured out how to send an email or how to use social media. I can do this now, I'm, I'm with everybody else now. And uh, it's kind of like that, it gives us a bit of a boost. And true confidence is actually based on competence. Mm. So if we're not able to do things, we hang back. If I'm not really able to mind myself in the toilet and I'm five years of age without mommy and daddy being around, I might hang back. I might pretend nothing happened. If I'm not really able to open up my lunchbox and navigate all the wrappings and, and then the cutlery and everything like that, because I need a bit of help with that, I might go, oh, I don't really, I'm not hungry, I don't like that. So we fall into a very human, natural kind of default mechanism, which is avoidance. So we could actually be teaching our children how to avoid things that cause us a little bit of stress. Yeah, I have a friend, she allows her kids to do their own packing and from an early age, from eight years of age, nine yeah. years of age, and I kind of realized I wouldn't even trust my kids to bring their <laughs> swimsuit or I probably wouldn't like what they'd put together, but that's yeah. not what's important. No. It's the learning. No. And if you have faith in them to make the right choices, then they feel that confidence and that yeah. competence, as you uh, say. Absolutely, absolutely. And listen, most of us as parents are going to be describing closer to what you have described. And we can't go from sort of zero to hero in one week or in between now and, and the next break in school. Um, so it's about saying, oh, you know what? I haven't ever asked them to do a bit of laundry, carrying stuff around the house. I've never asked them to clear the table. Uh, the first time I demand that they do it, they'll break my favorite plate or they'll mix things up. So you teach your child these skills. You take the time. You don't expect perfection. You take the time to teach them these skills, but they will start to feel more competent. And it could be something like, I don't know, maybe feeding the pet, if you have a pet at home. It could be doing a little favor, like going and getting something for you. So you're, you're thinking of safety. You're not getting them to make coffee for you, you know, or to, to cook a lovely meal, but you're teaching them little skills that they can do safely. And you want and to walk in and say, great job, well done, you did your best, not there's still food on the floor absolutely, here. Absolutely, yeah. You know, you broke that place. Yes. Just, it's a time for you to be positive again. Yeah. Now, can we tackle the big thing of the modern age, the screens yes. and the devices? Yes. Um, because they're not going anywhere yes. and you can't hide your kids away from it all. So how do you manage it properly? Well, I, I suppose every household, every parent is going to think of their own way and whether a parent says, we actually won't have any screens in our home, or we have all the screens, we have every product possible in our home. Both of those situations are okay. But what I would say to parent is, parents is to really be realistic about it, to think about what would your ideal goal be, and to think about what's realistic for your child. So as you said, screens are not going away. And, uh, and a parent might make the decision that they're not going to have access to screens, but they will eventually have access to screens. So maybe teaching them about how to manage those screens. So it's about not being afraid to put your ideas and your principles in place. So if you feel, for example, that this game, this app um, is not appropriate for my child, your child should not have access to those things. You're in charge. And if you start that early, if you start before they start having, let's say, their own uh, mobile phone, um, for example, you, you're creating the idea that my parent is going to be part of my screen time and they're going to monitor my screen time. If you've let them off their whole childhood and then at 
such an age and they get their first smartphone and then all of a sudden you want to be involved. They're going to be like, keep away from me. You're creeping me out. You're being nosy. Trust me. So, so make it part of parenting. Be interested in what they look at on screen. So show some interest. Now, for many parents, they will, they will say, oh, um, I don't know, Minecraft would do my head in, or I'm not interested in seeing this video again on YouTube. Uh, and that's fair enough. But show some interest in what your child is okay, doing. Okay, so it's a collective thing. A collective it's thing. It's not something they do on their own. Not always, no. So you, you're, 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 you're tipping in and out of what they're doing. So you know what their interests are. You're showing an interest in their interests. You're not dismissing their interests, but you're also minding their safety. There's other things that I would ask parents to keep in mind, and that is, of course, times of the day. Screens are not good during what we call transition times. They're a distraction. So a transition time is getting up, getting ready, and getting out to work in school. That's a They're a distraction. So put them away um, when those things are happening. And if somebody is ready way in advance, maybe that's a reward, a spontaneous reward. Um, it could be during mealtime. I mean, how special are mealtimes? Um, we've worked so hard to put this meal together. It's a, a chance to sit down and to share our day. So maybe have a curfew around mealtime so that we actually do talk to one another. Um, and the other thing would be around bedtime. So we've been hearing that that blue light interferes with our, it makes us more alert. And, uh, and maybe it's going to make it difficult for our children to wind down at night. So pick nighttime routines that um, are conducive to winding down, reading a book, telling a story together, having your wash, doing these kinds of things that are normal, natural, and slow paced so that um, there's a gap between my last time on screen and when I should be wound down. And then of course, really importantly, I would be saying to parents is um, be aware of any threats that are out there. So be aware, for example, if your child has an app where they can connect with other people um, and, and know what they're doing and, and just check in with your child on their safety online. And I suppose it's monkey see, monkey do. You can't be severely limiting their screen time and yet you're constantly yeah. scrolling on your phone without no. it. You have to go and hide in another room. No, it's a bit like having another sausage roll and saying, eat that broccoli. You know, it's kind of like that. So um, they see what we do. They notice what we do. So if they're telling us about the picture that they drew or how they saved a goal today and we're looking in our screen, that's not really going to pass on the right message. So it means we as adults putting our screens away when we're trying to get ready for things. And I suppose there's going to be times where we're going to be busy and we'll have to say not right at this moment, yeah. but it's important that when our child comes to us to show us something, to yeah. ask us something, that we yes. give them that time, we give them our full attention. Yeah. So when a child approaches us to ask a question or to show us something, they're primed in their little world to engage with us. And remember their little world, they're just about the center of it. They're learning that they are pretty much the center of it, but there's other, there's other players now. There's their parents and siblings and grandparents and everything. Um, so they're really, really primed. Uh, I'm interested in talking about this and I'm bringing it to you. Now, if you can, and I would encourage parents as much as possible to stop, to listen to the story, to look at what's been drawn, to see what they've done, if, they, if they're using an app to see what's happened and to engage with it. And we may not know a lot about it, uh, about how to find a diamond in Minecraft, or we may not know what they've drawn, but we might comment and that looks really difficult. And how did you find that diamond? Or, wow, look at all the colors you've, you've used. That's really beautiful colors. Um, if we can't do it, I mean, sometimes we're holding a baby. We're, we're cooking a hot meal. Yeah. Something else is going on. Come back to it. Use your body language to say, I'm going to get to you, you know, and then come right back to it. But do come back to it because we're letting them know I'm interested in your world. I'm interested in the things that you want to show me. And I'm delighted that you want to share your world with me. Now, something that comes up time and time again in any health discussion I've had is the importance of sleep. And Absolutely. that's really important for kids also, particularly yeah. at this developmental stage. Yeah. So if children in early childhood could see things the way that maybe a child psychologist would see it and use adult language, they would be saying to their parents, please help me to get enough sleep. Even though they say, please, I don't want to go to bed right even now, or could give you awful hell going to bed. Even it's the though, best thing for their brain. Even though they're coming up with strategies all evening long, how to delay this thing, because they're curious and they're interested. And of course they have high levels of energy, but they do need to wind down. So 
Listen, we all keep hearing that sleep is important. We all keep hearing that um, with each generation, we get less and less sleep, the more distractions from electricity to TV and now the internet. So there's more things to keep us awake. Um, but sleep is, is about resting and it's about recharging our batteries, but not just that. Um, child neuropsychology is now telling us that sleep is about the housekeeping for, for the brain. It's a, it's a way we have of maintaining good brain health. And that's related to all of the other cycles in our body, not just alert and tired, but appetite, mood, all of these kinds of things. So it's really, really important that we get sleep. The other thing is we're sending our child off to a new world, a new world with lots more people, new relationships, new subjects to learn, maybe a new language, all of these things. And sleep is about the processing of information. So that's what happens. It, memory moves from short term to more long term memory. So without enough sleep, we probably will learn things and then just forget them. So we need to process those. So, Pater, where can parents go for more support? Where can they access some resources? Well, we're here in a lovely library today, and, uh, and I would say to parents to check in with their local library, to check in with their library's website. There's resources, there are talks, there are seminars that, that are available. Also, to remember that maybe your f local family resource centre um, so they're around the country, um, you can find them on the net and you can give them a ring, ask them if they have a parenting course, if they have talks or seminars going up. And, and I would say maybe ring your local primary care service in the HSE and ask if you have a very particular question about your child's development and say, could I speak with someone and find out um, what resources are in my community. And it's okay to go to a parenting class. It doesn't mean that you're failing. It's a totally new skill you're taking on. If you start at tennis, you get a tennis coach. So yeah. why do we not naturally go for a parenting class when we have humans to yeah. bring up? Because somebody gave us this strange message that we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to learn by our own mistakes. And listen, we will make mistakes and we will learn from them and that's absolutely okay. But we don't have to do everything that way. And, uh, and keep in mind that parenting courses that are available around the country, both in person and online, they're non-judgmental. It's not about being a good or a bad parent. It's about learning strategies that can just help you to make that part of your life that little bit easier. There are loads of different programs around the country. So that one is called Triple P and it's available all around Ireland. There's Parents Plus, which is a homegrown one, which grew out of the Matter Hospital in Dublin. And uh, so the idea behind those types of parenting courses is we could all use one and they're good for everybody. I say get all the help you can get. Patrick, yeah. thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Claire.